Now we're going to get into everything. Are you ready? Awesome. So at Passion Student Ministries, we've been talking about identity, um, which is a huge topic. Like, we decided we wanted to do this, and then we started thinking, whoa, there's a lot to cover here. Um, And so this morning, I want to continue on in our identity series, and we're actually going to talk about the sin nature of our identity. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I just thank you for who you are. God, I thank you for being great and mighty. God, I thank you for being <clears throat> strong and powerful and good. God, I thank you that you are going to just break off some lies this morning that we maybe have believed for a little too long. God, we give you glory and honor for who you are. We praise your name. God, we give you all of our honor and all of our praise, Jesus. You are a holy God, and we stand in awe of you. God, I pray that all of the words that I'm about to speak would be yours and not mine. God, I pray that you shut my mouth if there's anything I'm not supposed to say. We thank you for this morning, and we thank you for an awesome experience in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Woo! Um, if I cough, I prom- it is, promise it is not COVID, okay? I just got some allergy stuff going on. It's okay. I promise. I promise. But I'm going to try not to cough. Um, So originally, I wanted to title this message Stockholm Syndrome, because that's just, I don't know, that's the view I had of people who, you know, embrace their sin nature identity a little more than others. Um, But man, Jesus is so much more graceful than I am, and he's so much more better than I am. He kind of tapped on my shoulder one day in the car and said, I don't want you to call it Stockholm Syndrome. I want you to call it POW which is prisoner of war. You see, many times prisoners, um, at least back in the day, there are some laws in place now that try to make POWs a little more of a humane experience. Um, But back in the day, many prisoners lived months and years with a crushing sense of doom, seeing their comrades dying from disease, starvation, exposure, misguided bombardments, lack of medical care, and murdered by firearm, bludgeon, bayonet, and sword. Thousands have suffered through forced marches on little to no rations, while exposed to extreme weather and cruel brutalization. If too injured or ill to keep up, men were left to die. They have been victims of such war crimes as torture and mutilation, beatings, and forced labor under inhumane conditions. Prisoners have been targets of intense interrogation and political indoctrination. Most prisoners of war carry physical and psychological scars from their experience as captives. And it's just such an interesting thing that Jesus would look at us like we're prisoners of war rather than infatuated with our sin. But a lot of times that's how we look at other sinners, at least I did. And I think social media just makes that so much easier. You know, you can judge people from behind a screen while you're scrolling and it's just so easy. And, and so in my own heart, as I, as I say these words to you, please know that I, this, is, this is for me too. <laughs> I had to take a heart check in this message and am still uncovering what that heart check is. So I hope that there is something that stands out to you. There's something fresh that you can grab hold of this morning. Um, I got a little scared because Pastor Winston got up here and just started preaching my message. And I was like, you got to stop, bro. Like, you got you got to stop because I'm not going to I'm going to get up there and I'm not going to have anything to say. You really you need to just cut it off. But the truth of the matter is that sin is a part of our identity this side of heaven. And we see this in Romans 5.12, where it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. But God makes a way for us to get back to him, right? So we're parted by sin. God makes a way for us. In the Old Testament, he did this through the law with sacrifices and really gory stuff. I mean, if you're ever really bored with the Bible, just go back to like 1 Kings, 2 Kings. You get some crazy stories in there, man, like Game of Thrones kind of stuff. Not that I've ever watched Game of Thrones, so I just, I always say that, but I'm like, I don't, I don't, it's, it's, it's dark, whatever. Um, <laughs> and then, in ter- like, and then he, 
he finishes that through the sacrifice of his son, right? He makes a way to have com- for us to have communion with him. But the interesting thing is that Jesus says this verse in Luke 9, 23. And Jesus talking says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily. Daily. Which tells me that my sin nature is still a part of my identity. If I have to daily take up a cross, if I have to daily check myself, if I have to daily check my attitude, if I have to daily go and climb up on that cross like he did in different areas and in different seasons of my life, at different moments, but every single day, then that sin nature is still alive. But let's make it really simple. Why is sin a big deal? And it's, it seems simple, but it separates us from God. You see, we serve a holy God. He cannot be in the presence of sin. And so he had to make a way to have communion with us. And what a beautiful gift that is because he, he desires us. A holy God desires communion with you. We made the choice that separated us. And he still made a way. It's a beautiful thing that he sent his son to die for us so that we could come to him. But let's define sin, right? Because I feel like that's important too. And the definition, now, there are multiple sections of Scripture in the New Testament that list, like, sin. Like, if you've been through the New Testament, you've caught some of them. But I I chose Galatians 5, 19, 19 through 21. And it says, The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. That's a really long list. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And while it can be those very obvious things, as Pastor Winston so beautifully pointed out, it can also be Jeremiah 17, 9, where the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. So what does that mean? That means that in those moments when people don't see your sin, God still does. In those moments that we raise our hands and worship more for attention than his glory. In those moments when we pridefully give out of our abundance rather than humbly give out of his grace for us. It's those small heart checks that no one sees, right? And I think the importance of what Pastor Winston said and the importance of this message coming, piggybacking on what he said is that for us to be the light, we have to get this right in here first. We have to check our heart daily because those little things just creep in. I I read a commentary on, on that verse in Jeremiah And it's by Dr. Thomas Constable. And it says, in our day, we often hear advice, follow your heart. It will never lead you astray. (laughs) This counsel reflects the self-sufficient attitude of the world. If we just follow our hearts and what feels right, the truth is that we'll often make mistakes and get into trouble. Rather than following our hearts, we need to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit as he guides us with the word of God. And it was never God's intention for you to be a prisoner of war. Like, let's get, that, let's get that straight. When he created everything, he never said, I'm gonna set him up for failure. <laughs> His intention was choice. What is love without choice, right? Like, my husband and I just celebrated 12 years of marriage. Yeah, we're super excited. But one of, sometimes I marvel at the fact that he chose me. He has choices. And I love that we choose each other, right? And that's part of the beauty in love. And the beauty of God's love is that he chose us even when we didn't choose him. Like he chose us over and over and over again. But how do we experience that freedom, right? That, that close communion with God. How do we take up our cross daily? And that's where we're going we're gonna to go today. 
But I have to say that this is not an exhaustive list by any means. I barely skimmed the surface, I'm sorry. But I think that there are really practical things in things like table talks and in things like the crews that we have set up and these beautiful moments of community that we've been able to create here at New City Church. I think those practical things like the nitty gritty tips come in sharing your testimony around a table. They come in crews where you're vulnerable with this close knit of people who can say, man, I may not have the exact same struggle, but I had a similar one, and these are the steps I took to help me overcome it. We create accountability, which is one of my points, so I'm not gonna go there yet, but we create beautiful things in these communities to help us overcome the sin nature that we're all battling. <clears throat> so point number one, is that we have to live our lives like sin is a cancer, not a cold. You see, a cold requires a quick fix, whereas a chronic illness requires a lifestyle change. And, and, and this is just a really pretty way of repentance, right? where you abandon your old ways, you abandon your old desires, you abandon the old things, you make some healthy changes for yourself. Maybe you change up some people that you've been hanging out with. Maybe you change up some places that you've been going to. Maybe you change out one of these nice, like, upgraded high-def devices for one of the old-school cell phones that don't have internet access. Maybe we get as serious with our sin as it's gotten with us. You see, in Romans 6, 23, it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He gives us a gift. And so we have to get serious with our sin. And I think in order to do that, that leads me to my next point, we have to know the power we have access to, right? And for this, I'm going to invite both Pastor Zach's up to the stage. <laughs> if you didn't know, we have two. <laughs> we have Pastor... Zach Booker and Pastor Zach Jeffries. If you spend any amount of time around them, they will make you laugh. Um, but more than that, they're honorable, really great, amazing, good men. Um, if you have boys, you want them around these two. Like, incredible guys. <clears throat> but a lot of times what happens with sin is that it just comes in and it just kind of starts to irritate us a little bit. It just starts to, to fidget with us a little bit. And it, it pokes at us, and we just kind of, you know, you nudge, it, you nudge it away, right? It's irritating, but, but then, you know, sometimes the grip gets a little tighter. And in case you haven't caught on, I'm married to him, by the way. Um, <laughs> just in case. Uh, <laughs> but but if, you get, if you try to rely on your own strength for long enough, you don't, you can't as easily, if you haven't noticed, I'm not, I can't win this battle. He has entangled me in sin. And sometimes, sorry, can you come back? Thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Knew that was coming. Sometimes we wait to this point to say, hey, Holy Spirit, can you come help me? But then the Holy Spirit's having to do extra work too because we've gone and entangled ourselves in sin. Is he capable? Yes. Is he powerful? Yes. And are there really beautiful moments when he comes and just breaks everything loose? Yeah. I think those are beautiful testimonies. Those have just never been my testimonies. <laughs> Anytime I've gotten myself entangled in sin, me and the Holy Spirit have had to work really hard together to get myself out. And so what needs to happen is that I think we'll all have this like little inclina inclination when sin starts to mess with us to bump back. But when you notice the bump back, say, hey, Holy Spirit, can you handle that for me? You guys can go. Thank you so much. Give him a big round of applause. But we wait for those incredibly tough moments, right? where we're weakened by it, where we're already entangled and grasped in it. But the Holy Spirit is so powerful that he, he comes and he helps us. But we, ha we, we have to pick those right moments, right? We have to pick those moments of vulnerability where we say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Sometimes the Holy Spirit comes in those moments of confession. 
and helps keep us accountable. In Romans 8.26, I spent a lot of times in Romans. I'm really excited that we're going into Romans soon in our life night. Romans 8.26, it says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. Get this, through wordless groans. Have you ever just wanted something so bad that you just can't even speak? That's what he does for you. In John 16, 7, it says, But very truly, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking. It is for your good that I am going away. No one ever thought that. Just, you're not alone. No one ever thought, hey, it's good that Jesus goes away. (laughs) But he says that it's good that he goes away, because unless he goes, the advocate will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. I looked up the advocate in Greek, and it means a counselor, a barrister, which I think one of the few people who know this in this room is Zeno. Um, <laughs> but a, if you don't know, like I didn't know, a barrister is a lawyer in high courts. An advocate is a pleader, a spokesman, an apologist, which is one who argues defense. We have access to this power the minute we get saved, and it's so good and so strong and so powerful, and he's there to defend us. But so many of us just wait until we get entangled in sin, and then we're going, God, why, didn't, why aren't you helping me? And he's like, which leads me to point number three. We can't make a consequence of sin a characteristic of God. We cannot make a consequence of sin a characteristic of God and use it to blame God and give us an out for whatever we want to do. A lot of us keep sinning because the God we heard about or assume God to be is significantly less great than the God that he is. And while we discuss identity, I think it's important to discuss God's identity, right? He's holy and good. But the devil will always try to convince us that God is not who we know him to be. We see this in Genesis 3. Like, it's from the jump. <laughs> he, told, he told Eve, I'm sorry I didn't give you all this verse. He told Eve, this is what the serpent says, says to Eve, you will not certainly die. He literally just said, hey, God's a liar. Like, if you didn't catch it, that was the implication behind that statement. And then here's the second implication. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And that immediately says, God is holding out on you. And a lot of times when we get entangled in sin, that's what we believe in our heads. He's holding out on fun that we could be having. He's keeping us from, you know, having a good time or just, you know, it's not really hurting anyone. What's the big deal? And I love that it says knowing good and evil. (laughs) It doesn't say knowing the difference between good and evil. You know them. And I think PG alluded to that in his messages recently, or it may have been, I told Zach, I couldn't remember. He was preaching something that it triggered in my brain, but. But this point came up in a conversation that I was having with a friend who had recently lost a parent. They said, I don't see God in this. I said, well, of course you don't. Death is a consequence of sin. It's not a characteristic of God. It's not a part of his original design. Is he there with us through it? Yeah. Yeah, he's there with us. He supports us. He comforts it. He uses it all to our good. But don't let that consequence of sin become a characteristic of who he is. He is all good things. And in that, I think point number four is that we have to be willing to stand out. (laughs) He's good, but he's also, he's a little different. He tells people to do some crazy stuff, y'all. It's like, you want the walls of Jericho to fall? Just walk around them seven times silently. Huh? You want, you want me to, okay. 
Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> He's a little different. And we have to be willing to stand out. You see, our sin might not be outright or outrageous, but it can spring up easily. You know, I was riding in the car with my daughter. She's five now. Can't believe that. Um, you all were right. It goes by fast, okay? I'll give that to you. Um, <laughs> but she, look, she said, Mommy, look at all the pretty flowers. And I was like, baby, those are, those are weeds. They're weeds. They're weeds on the side of the road. That's what those are. She said, well, they look pretty. And I thought, it can be really difficult to free yourself from sin when you hang around people who call your sin pretty. It can be even more difficult when people compliment you for it or identify with you over it. You don't want to lose that friendship, and so you'll keep partaking in a specific activity because you, don't, you just don't want to sacrifice that person, right? That's what you identify over. That's what you guys talk about. But all those nutrients, all, all the good things that were supposed to be growing your relationship with God are getting sucked up by weeds of sin. In 1 Corinthians 5, 6, 5, 6, it says, Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? And here's the crazy thing is that verse comes from him talking about the Pharisees and Sadducees. These were people in the church. And so we have to know that in certain seasons, even some Christians maybe not be the best deep relationships for us. You see, if we're both struggling with the same thing, it's really hard to be able to support each other. And so in some seasons, you're like, I love you, I'm here for you. If, you know, if you, if you need anything, you know, desperately, please call me. But I just, I can't spend as much time with you right now. I just need a little bit of distance while I work out some things in my own life. And I think that's important to know is because a lot of times we just assume that it's all good. <laughs> like, we can all just be around each other all the time. I'm like, no, there are certain seasons and certain times where I needed some people who weren't going through what I was going through. I need some people to help pull me out. Which leads me to point number five. Accountability has to be a part of our cross, too. I'm going to roll over to James 5.16 for this one. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other. That's humbling, isn't it? Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. <clears throat> the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. No one likes to you know, just be like, hey, I'm just going to word vomit real quick about what I'm struggling with, and it's going to be great, and I'm going to trust that you think of me as a great person still, and we're going to go on our merry way. <laughs> it takes humility, and it takes vulnerability, <laughs> probably two of the hardest things <laughs> to cultivate in someone's life. But man, we make these choices so that maybe the Holy Spirit uses that person to tell you something you didn't know before or didn't think of yet, right? Rather than just battling things out on our own, we need the support of the people around us. We need their testimony. We need their testimony of hope and freedom, especially when we're in the struggle. To know that there is another side. It's not just the valley. God has mountains for us to climb. And again, that's why table talks and crews are so important. They're so vital because in those moments, you can be vulnerable with a small group of people. Like it's a lot easier than just getting up here and grabbing a mic and being like, hey guys, so I struggle with. <laughs> but we, those, those communities are created so that we can share, so that we can support each other, so that someone can send you a text in the middle of the week and say, hey, how are you doing with this? And they're not doing that to be mean or cruel. 
They're literally checking in on you to make sure that you're good. Be vulnerable enough to allow them to. That's hard. <laughs> That's where the Holy Spirit comes in, where I'm like, Jesus, you're going to have to take over because I really just want to respond kind of mean to this text right now. <laughs> but you let him come in, and you get, you get to experience that closer communion with God. But I have to admit that in, in some of my research, you know, I've, I got a little hung up one day. I was um, just doing more research on the topic of racism and different things, and I, I have to be careful because I go to dark places. Like, there's, there's just the darkness around racism that it's just, it's so, like, deep and hurtful and painful that I have to make sure I reinforce with the hope and the character of Christ and God in my life. <laughs> Can't just dive in and go too deep. But I was doing research and just reading about a lot of the history and things like that, a lot of the ideologies. <laughs> and I'm like, this has been going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And I got a little frustrated because I'm like, devil's playing the long game here. Like long, long game. What am I supposed to do with this much time in his long game? Holy Spirit said, you serve the God of time. And it reminded me of passion's core values. They're really simple. Love, serve. No. Love God, love people. Serve God serve people, know God, know people. We wake up and we do those things <laughs> daily. We take up our cross and we make choices to love people where they're at, <laughs> to love God with all that we have, to know who he is, and to know what people are going through, and to serve both of them. God is more powerful, and he is greater, and he is stronger than any sin that could come up against you. But man, we have to take our steps to take up that cross. We're getting ready to play a song, and it's called, Oh, Come to the Altar by Elevation. The beginning lines of this song are, Are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. But I remember listening to that one day. <laughs> I love the Holy Spirit. He just kind of tapped me on my shoulder. He was like, when's the last time you were overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? The small compromises that you make, and they may not be leaps and bounds in creating space between us, but those small steps add up. And I thought, it's been a while. It's been a while since I was overwhelmed by the weight of pride in my life. It's been a while since I was overwhelmed by the fact that I've let insecurity take a hold a little too long. It's been a while since I've admitted that I could use a lot more grace in my life for the people around me. So, Anthony, if you want to go ahead and start that song, we're actually going to stand in a time of worship, and if my prayer...